Well, welcome back to another analysis behind the news. You know, history is important. Now, when I say history, I mean true history, real history. Not the kind of thing that we all studied in school, whether it was public or private school. I have stated over and over again that there is no real American history taught in any institution that I know of in the United States. The problem that we are seeing right now is a little more visible when it comes to the elimination of history and changing history so that we can't find what is the true history of the United States, the true principles upon which the Constitution was founded, etc. One of the things that I just saw in this morning's newspaper, for instance, on page two of the Wall Street Journal, and you can't see it very well in this shot, the, the gray tones are such that you can't notice it, but it is a photograph of Jefferson Davis, the uh, Confederate president, the statue of, Confederate, of, of uh, Davis being moved out of view from the campus at the University of Texas to a building on campus. It's just another part of the campaign to get rid of anything that has anything to do with the Confederacy. Now, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, uh, I say, and have said for many, many years, if you choose, you lose when it comes to choosing sides uh, of the Civil War. The North was bad, the South was bad. Now, I'm not talking about the average guy in the trenches and that sort of thing. Jefferson Davis, for instance, his personal secretary was a man by the name of Burton Norville Harrison, his private secretary for Davis during the Civil War. He was a member of Skull and Bones, the order. Uh, those are some of the facts that I put in my forthcoming book on uh, To the Victor Go the Myths and Monuments to show how there's a lot of history that we don't know about. It's taken me 50 years to ferret out some of this stuff. And I concentrate more on the conspiracy in the North rather than in the South, but a few facts like that, uh, like around Jefferson Davis and others, I do bring out. Now, the thing is, it doesn't matter whether you're for it or against it or anything else. There is an obfuscation. There's a deliberate campaign to get rid of anything Confederate out of our history. Well, it is our history, after all. Let people study history, understand history, come down where they want to. Uh, too much of it is built in the racial thing and, and racial antagonism and slavery and all the rest of it that clouds a lot of history, regrettably. We get caught up in the emotion instead of the simple facts. Now, it's the ignorance of history that has uh, disturbed me the most in the Republican debates and in the Republican campaign. The part of history that bothers me the most is manifested in the proposals by every one of the Republican candidates. Now, I think I, I'm correct in this, that every one of the Republican candidates do not talk about getting back to the system our forefathers gave us relative to federal taxation. They want a fair tax, they want to reduce tax, they want to do this, they want to do that or the other, when actually the principle upon which our Constitution was based was you cannot have the federal government tax the individual and companies directly. It was illegal until we had the uh, 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment gave the power to the federal government to tax individuals. Our forefathers knew that if the federal government could directly tax the individual, that the federal government would have power over that individual or groups or companies. And that's why they didn't want it. And look what the IRS has become. That was the intent in all of this to the, uh, from the beginning, back in 1912 and 1913, was to give that power to the federal government to be able to control the political ideas and freedom of speech of the individual because they'd be powerless as individuals against this huge federal government. Now how did they tax the people before that? They taxed them indirectly. 
They taxed through tariffs and excise taxes. They weren't directly taxing the companies. They weren't directly taxing the individuals. So it was an indirect tax. Yes, it gave them a certain amount of control, but nothing like what it has become and was always intended to become. I have not heard of a single Republican candidate talk about getting rid of the 16th Amendment and getting back to the system that limits the taxing power of the federal government. Not only limits the taxing power, but limits the taxes that they can even get in order to run the federal government. And that was one of the reasons, too, was they knew that only a certain amount of tariffs and so forth could drive a certain size of government. And so it was a taxing limitation besides the other constitutional limitations on the size, scope, and power of the federal government. Now, linked to that was this, the 17th Amendment. Because the 17th Amendment changed the whole complex uh, complexity of the Senate of the United States. The Senate is, is part of a bicameral system. One house represents the people. The other house represents the states. That house was the Senate. So the state governments appointed, elected by the legislature, the, the United States senators. They went to Washington, D.C. to represent the states. The House of Representatives, they went to Washington, D.C. to represent the people. Now then, if the people's house started to put a lot of pork barrel in the, uh, in, in, a lot of pork rather, into legislation to buy the votes of the people, the Senate was able to stop that. Now why was that? Because they only had a certain amount of a budget from all these tariffs and excise taxes, right? If they went over budget, which they often did, most of the time, they sent a bill to every one of the states apportioned based on their population. In other words, Wyoming would pay less than New York because of the differences in population. Now, what happened was the legislature who appointed these senators would say, hey, wait a minute, Mr. Senator, uh, you voted for this pork barrel laden legislation that we have to pay for out of the largest of the state legislature to make up for the federal budget. That's how it was done. And so the legislatures would get very mad at the people they sent to the Senate if they went along with this. And so they had to get rid of that, too. They had to get rid of that check and balance, not just on the power, uh, particularly, of the federal government, but on its taxing ability, its budgeting ability, and how they got those funds. And so it was a real problem, a real sea change in 1913 when they changed this by the adoption of the 16th and 17th Amendment. Now, we never hear of a Republican candidate ever talking about this, that we've got to go back to the system our forefathers gave us. It limits the size of government. It limits how they can spend the money. It retains power in the states to counterbalance the federal government. That's what it's all about. All these checks and balances that are within the system to keep government from getting out of hand, becoming too powerful, becoming too big, and ruling the people. And yet I have, again, reiterating, I have not heard of a single Republican candidate that talks about this. Is it a hard sell? You bet it is. But it is a sell we have to start selling. It's, it's an educational war being able to talk about history, to be able to talk about the way it was and why our government was better at that period than it is today where it's gotten out of control. How do we get back to that? You get back to it by starting to talk about it, having the intestinal fortitude to get up in front of the American people and point these things out. And yet we've got conservatives and constitutionalists running for president that never discussed these things. I have to ask the question, why? And when I have my own answer to that, it's a little bit disturbing. You might have a different answer than I do. Until next week, we'll see you then.